spake Jesus, and lifted his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know that the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. And we're to title our message today would be the Lord's High Priestly Prayer. I know there's a couple of places in the Bible where there is uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's a, really a model prayer. Uh, Jesus is teaching in both instances and he give this model prayer that we follow. But that's a model for us to follow. But the true Lord's Prayer is shown here. Uh, uh, here is one example of Jesus praying to his Father, the God of heaven. Amen? Amen. The Lord's High Priestly Prayer. Uh, we know that Jesus is our high priest. The scriptures replete uh, with various scriptures indicating such. I know in the book of Hebrews, chapters 5, 7, and 8, uh, gives their scripture references about the, the priesthood of Jesus. Uh, we know uh, that God ordained Christ to be the high priest. We know that as he is sitting in heaven, Scripture tells us now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions. And, and we know that in that culture, the high priest is the one that made intercessions to God for men. Amen? So Jesus is himself that high priest. Uh, the word uh, here in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verses 5 and 6 so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Verse 6, as he saith in another place, Scripture reads, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This Melchizedek is a strange fellow, if I might use that word. Uh, he was a high priest. Uh, of the priest of the Most High God. Uh, there is scripture that speaks of when Abraham, I think Lot and his nephew and some of his other servants and much of his property had been stolen by five kings. Well, Abraham, empowered by God, went after these five kings to get his nephew Lot, his family, and all of his property back. And Abraham was able to annihilate, he slaughtered all of those kings, and he not only rescued his lot and his family and all of his property, but he even spoiled the kings, all of their property that he was able to take. And so coming back, Melchizedek meets him, and there's a worship service done right there, and it says that uh, Abraham paid tithes to this high priest called Manet Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, as I said earlier, he was a strange or different. We had not seen him before. He was called the king of Salem, peace. He was called a priest of the Most High God. It says that he met, met Abraham as he was coming back, and Abraham gave him tithes. He was also, this Melchizedek, was called the king of righteousness. Uh, also, as we said, a king of peace. He, in verse 3 here, it's in Hebrews chapter 7, it said he was without father, without mother, without descent. There was no beginning of days with him, nor was there an end of life, but he was made like unto the Son of God, abideth of priest continually. That's forever. So this Melchizedek, 
when you looked at his pedigree, so to speak, you didn't find out who his mother was, nor his father. Uh, there were no ancestors that came before him that you could look to to say, oh, I know he's the son of this. And certainly there were no one else that came behind him that you could tie to him and say, oh, this is the son of Melchizedek. He just stepped into the pages of history and he stepped out. And many believe who study the scriptures believe that this Melchizedek, this high priest of the most God most high, was in fact a pre-incarnate representation, pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That he just stepped into history for that moment in time to deal with that issue and step back out until a later time. There are other instances where we believe that Christ made this pre, those pre-incarnate uh, appearances. Amen? Amen. Jesus' priesthood uh, has preeminence over Melchizedek. And this was way before, many hundreds of years before, the ironic priesthood was set up. We know when God set up uh, Moses to lead the people, when they got over a pro town in the wildernesses, God set certain ordinances in place. And one of those was establishing the priesthood. Aaron, Moses' brother, became the first priest. But this Melchizedek preceded all of those by hundreds of years. So as we said, he was a strange individual. But here again, God, who's God, doing what God believes he needs to do in any particular situation. So Jesus' priesthood is certainly preeminent over Melchizedek. Uh, for his priesthood is superior to any and all others. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25 says this, speaking of Jesus. But this man, because he continues forever, had an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he's able also to save them to the uttermost, to the highest degree that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercessions for them. So Jesus has this everlasting priesthood, amen? And he has the power to save, it, amen? amen? And that's not been said of any other priest that I've read about in the Bible that have the ability to save, but this Jesus, Jesus, this high priest of God, he has the ability to save, and he ever lived to make intercessions. He's able to go to the Father and ask the Father to part of us. Amen? Amen. 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 Yes. Jesus, therefore, I'm setting this up, Jesus, therefore, is well qualified to utter this prayer found in chapter 17 on our behalf. Amen? Amen. He's qualified. He is that high priest. The high priest uh, in, the, uh, in that Jewish tradition, in Jewish life, he was the uh, uh, number one of preeminent a religious leader and his job not only uh, was to make uh, intercessions for the people uh, but he also had to make intercessions up to God on his own behalf for his own personal sake amen that's never been said of Jesus amen this high priest uh, once a year he would go into the holy of holies he would go into the outer court he'd go into the uh, into the temple and he would do his religious services. But that holy of holy, that little room where the Ark of the Covenant is, the cherubim, he would only be allowed to go in there once a year. And he would go in and make intercessions and he'd sprinkle blood around to make uh, intercessions on behalf of the people to God. But Jesus is the number one preeminent high priest. Jesus is prayer life. Amen, so uh, I've, I've, uh, I've been struggling. Uh, yeah, I've said this before. Uh, my prayer life is not what it ought to be. Amen? And I'm, I'm, I've got a two-part prayer. Lord, teach me to pray. Yeah. And Lord, teach me to love you. Amen? And that's a two-part prayer. And... And I prayed that for a while, and not a lot, not a lot happened. And I keep praying that prayer. And at our convention a couple of weeks ago now, Dave Sutton was preaching. Don't remember all the text, but 
it talked about finding time or making time to spend with God. And I came under conviction because I was not and have not been finding the time to spend with God. Everybody wants to hear a word from God. Everybody loves to say, God spoke to me. I, mean, that, I hear those testimonies, and I'm, I'm deeply touched and moved when an individual said, God spoke to me. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going through it. God sent me a word. You know what I mean? That's a beautiful testimony. And, and I'm going, Lord, I'm not hearing anything. Uh, but what, what I see is that I've been so distracted. There's so much noise in my life. And over these past uh, two years or so, I've been consumed with the world stuff, the government stuff, and all the madness, all the confusion, and, and the television. And, and I'm being consumed, eaten up by hours and hours of television, all of this foolishness. And, and, and so when I turn to God, I'm, I'm all worn out. I'm tired. I don't have time to pray. I don't even have time to sit still and, and try to wait for a word from the Lord. Amen, somebody. So the Lord's been dealing with me. And, and since the convocation, I've just said, Lord, help me. Uh, I, I've got to get this noise out of my life. And, and those hours that I would spend before the television, I, I said, Lord, just, just help me. And so. I'm just sharing this because it, it might help somebody. I haven't had my TV on for the last 10 days. I just will not turn it on. Now, that does not mean that I've gotten where I want to be, but I've taken the noise out of my life. So I can sit, if no more, just sitting there thinking about the goodness of God. Uh, and maybe when I read, I, 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 there's a little more quiet. So what does all of that mean? I, I don't know. But right now, uh, I'm just thankful for getting the noise out of my life. But I do say this. Remember this, though. And when Jesus said when a demon is thrown out of a man and the house is swept and garnished, but you don't fill it with something else, right? The demon, seven more demons going to come in. And the worst, and that state of the man be worse than it was before. So pray for me. I just want God's stuff to fill that, that space. Amen. So God, teach me to pray. And God, teach me to love him. And, and just pray for me. Amen. So Jesus, he had this extraordinary prayer life. And, and I just uh, just want to touch on a few things. And, and whether he was praying alone or uh, whether he was praying publicly. Uh, in uh, Matthew, it, it, I believe it's chapter 14, where he went into the mountain alone to pray. Amen. And I, and I would imagine he would, as often he could slip away by himself, he would go to that some alone place where he could spend time with the Father. Amen. Amen. It, it, it's a prayer as we said, at that communication that God makes available to us where we can go directly to him. We don't have to go to the priest. Amen. We can go directly to God. So Jesus would go directly to his father. Uh, when he was there at Lazarus too, uh, he, he prayed. What did he say? He, he said, Father, I thank thee that you heard me. But this is something else he said. He said, but Father, you always hear me. Oh, Lord. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't you just want to be in that place when, when, when you could say to the Father, Father, you always hear my prayer. Amen. So what, what, a, what a person here in the, in the person of Jesus in terms of prayer that we should be uh, emulating. Father, you've always heard me. Amen. And in uh, Matthew, I think, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, we know how he had gone there uh, praying. Lord, let this cup pass. And, you know, he prayed that prayer, you know, three times. And each time he would say, but nevertheless, let your will be done. Amen. So, and we know that uh, when he's fed the 4,000 and the 5,000, how he, he 
bless the bread, so to speak, prayed before the Lord. So he, there are numerous instances uh, where he was praying. He had a very active prayer life that we should uh, emulate for ourselves. Amen? Uh, as we said, Jesus is, uh, uh, as we didn't say, but Jesus' public ministry as recorded in the Gospel of John. It shows that his public ministry concluded uh, with the end of chapter 12, uh, chapters 13 through 17. Uh, we refer to that as uh, Jesus' time there in the upper room. I think it's referred to as the upper room discourse. And just for a definition, discourse, let's just mean this, a formal, lengthy discussion on a particular subject, whether it's actually written down or actually spoken. That was what's going on. So Jesus is in his upper room. He's giving, so to speak, the last minute instructions. Should there be anything that he may not have touched on, he used that as an opportunity to speak into the hearing of his disciples, knowing that in a matter of hours, uh, his hour uh, would have come. And we'll talk, touch on that. He said uh, during this time, he we know he washed the disciples' feet. Amen. Uh, how he went around the room, he laid his garments aside, girded himself with the towel, washed their feet. And he began to speak to them, I think John chapter 14, about his going away. Now he had been saying that uh, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem, where I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of Gentiles and I'll be crucified. But after the third day, I will rise again. He said that a number of times throughout his Three minute, three year ministry talking to his disciples. And so he uh, is speaking to them about going to prepare a place for them in heaven. Uh, he in introduces the receiving of the Lord's uh, Supper. He demonstrated that before uh, his disciples. And he also introduced them to the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, There, when I go, the Father is going to send a comfort. Comforter, amen? amen, and that was the coming of the Holy Spirit. So, even in these last hours, Jesus is going, so He's getting some things done, amen. He's preparing, amen. And so, He now, as He's given these instructions, now He turns and goes before the Father again this prayer. And I would say this, this as I said earlier, this is not the model prayer in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. This is Jesus' personal prayer to his Father. Amen? So intimate. Amen. Jesus turning. And I'm sure uh, it does not give us any indication that he went off to a separate little corner of the room or whether he just stopped whatever he was doing and turned to the Father, looked look upward toward heaven, and began to speak to his Father. He, he says, says this, he said, uh, Father, the hour is come. The hour is come. There were a number of occasions where he would say, my hour is not yet come. They didn't know what he was talking about, even when his mother asked him, about the wine. She asked him, or rather told him that there was no wine. He said, woman, what have I to do with you? He said, my hour has not come yet. Amen. So what he is, that hour is now here. That was the time of his passion, his suffering on the cross. That time is just a, perhaps a, just a number of hours from now. So that's where he said, our father, my hours come. He said, glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. That word glorify, just honor. Esteem high, amen. He said, glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. Throughout the Gospels, uh, as we said, he spoke about his time, heaven not come. But now, he said, my appointed time is here. Now, his time, that is my note, says that, now it's his time to go to the cross and die for the sin of the world. Uh, you're, you, Father, he says, you have given him, he's speaking of himself in the third person. 
He said, you, Father, have given him, meaning Jesus, you've given me power, that's authority, over all flesh. He said that he, that is I, may give eternal life to all that he have given him. So God had, what he's expressing here, that God, you've given me the power of all flesh. Uh, I have the power, the authority to grant eternal life to all or any of those that have, you have called to come to me. And that's what he's expressing here. Uh, verse 3, I have this question, what is eternal life? Jesus defined it this way. Jesus said, eternal life is to know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who he sent. Amen. Eternal life is to know God. That word know, it's just not head knowledge. Amen. It's just not head knowledge. It is to know, to be intimate, to have an intimate relationship with God. To know who he is and what he has done and what he represents in our, in our life. That is to know him in a most intimate way. At verse 4, he said, I have glorified you on earth. Jesus always would honor his father. Uh, you know, the, he was, uh, when one tried to heap praise on him, he redirected that praise. You know, remember when that rich young ruler ran down to Jesus and said, good master, you know. And he said, hey, there's only one good, that's the God of heaven. So he was always Re honoring his father. He re uh, redirected any praise that was being directed to him. And he says to God, I have finished my assignment. Everything that God had ordained him to do, he finished it. Now only the cross awaiting him. Revealing God to men, that was his job. But most importantly, it was to die for the sin of the world. Even though Jesus was uh, a human, but he was still God in the flesh. So scripture said he was the fullness, the completeness of the Godhead. If you could just imagine the spirit God wrapped in, in a human body, that was Jesus. He was all God in everything that God, the essence of God, everything that God is, so was Jesus, just wrapped in flesh. Amen? Amen. Jesus, here at verse 5, he asked the Father to give him the glory that he had with the Father before the Word was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, Scripture says, and the Word was God. So what he's saying, that that glory, that before the foundations of the world, before there was any beginning, amen, Jesus was already God. And he had the same glory, the same essence that God has. Jesus had it too. Amen. And so in order to, to do what God needed to be done, that is to come to earth and redeem mankind, that, that uh, essence had to be uh, concealed. It had to be packaged, so to speak, in such a way. And that's such a way I'm being... I'm saying it this way for a reason. That this Godhead, who Jesus was the fullness thereof, he was wrapped in human flesh. Yes. And even though he was human, 100% human, he was still all God. Yes. And all the tender glory that comes with being God, Jesus had all of that. Yes. And he willingly laid all of that aside yes. to become human, to step into humanity. Yes. Not only to step in, but to to go to the cross and die. Amen. So when he said, all that glory that I had, Lord, let that be restored. Oh, glory. Amen, somebody. Amen. But, you know, he, he did it. Why? Because he loved us so. Amen. When he, when he says, uh, when they had him there, they thought they were taking his life. And he said, no man can take my life. He had the power even right there to change everything. He had the power to do that. He said, no man can take my life. He said, he said, I lay it down. He laid it down freely. He was motivated by love. Love for us. Helpless sinners. Couldn't help ourselves. God had to do it all. He made that ultimate sacrifice. He freely gave himself up 
Jesus, God gave himself up to be that sacrifice for sin. And he died on Calvary's cross in our place. Amen. Amen. Verse uh, 6 and 8, he says this. I have manifested your name unto men. That is, I have made known your name, which thou gavest me out of the word. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of you. So what he what he's saying here, uh, God, he, he made God to know that the men that God had given him, that they came, were given to him from the Father. Because the word tells us no man can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. Amen? Amen. Jesus describes those that have come to him in this fashion and, and include us in here, okay? Amen? Because we're, we're in the family too, amen? We're in the house. Jesus says, they were yours. You gave them to me. They have kept, they have obeyed your word. What a, what a wonderful testimony that Jesus has given about the saints that have come to him. That's us, amen? Amen. Uh, they know all things that you gave me come from you. Amen. They, they know that this is God in the flesh. He is indeed the son of God. And the things that Jesus, uh, these things that he was uttering, that he was uttering, those things that he was teaching, uh, these things were not heard of. They weren't taught that way. These were new things to them. Uh, the old uh, laws that they were... Uh, the old, not the, the traditions, I should say, of the elders, how they were being taught. Well, this is what Jesus was teaching was entirely different. Amen. He says this, I gave them your words and they received, that is, they accepted them as truth. Amen. They believed that I came from you and that you sent me. Amen. So he is letting God know that there, I have been validated through what these believers truly believe, that I am one that have come with your words and that you have actually sent me. Amen, somebody. Amen. Verse uh, 9 and 10, it says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou have given me, for they are thine. And he says, all mine are thine and, and thine are mine. Let me just put some plainer language in there. He says that, the, the, yours are mine and mine are yours. Amen? That's the essence of this. He, he says, Jesus uh, is praying for us, the born again believers. He's not praying for an unsaved world. Amen? Let's get that clear. Amen? The world will have to sit on its own bottom, so to speak, like an old pot. Amen? He's praying for us as saints. He's praying for us. He's not praying for the world. He's praying exclusively for us, and that's all of his saints. Uh, this should lift our very spirit, amen, that we know the God of heaven is praying for us, amen? amen. That, that ought to get us ready to shout right now because we've been laboring, we've been laying on this prayer, amen? amen. But we get a jump start when we know that Jesus is praying likewise yes. for us, amen? Praying to the Father on our behalf. This verse 10, all yours are thine and thine are mine. I am glorifying them. This, there's this mutuality of relationship between the Father and Son. We know they're both God. This mutuality. He, he speaks of those things that belong to the Father. Those things belong to me too. Amen. Amen. And when we who are born again believers, when we yoke up with God, the Father and God, the Son and the Holy Spirit, those things which are those, theirs, those are ours too. Because he's praying and we'll see praying for unity, you know, as he and the Father are one, he wants us to be uh, one with him. Amen? Amen. Jesus says to the Father, I'm glorified, honored in them. They honor me in their hearts and with their lives. Amen? Amen. It's, 
You honor God in your heart. You strive to be obedient uh, to what God commands us to do. But it's walked out in our lives. Amen? In our lives. Amen. And we ought to see a demonstration of our walk with the Lord as we walk it out in our own lives. Here in verse 12, I said earlier that he's praying for unity. Verse 11 and 12. And he said, uh, now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou have given me, that they may be one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus knows that he's now leaving the world. Uh, he asked the Father to keep us, to keep those disciples, and that's us too, those that have come and believe in what they have taught us. He asked the Father to keep those in his name who the Father has given him. Uh, we are being kept by God. We're in good hands, folks. Amen? When we... Uh, when we're born again believers and we're trust the living God, we're in his hand. He, he takes responsibility for us. Amen. We can literally get out of the driver's seat of our lives. Get over and let God take control. And, and when he takes control, he's responsible. Yes. Amen. And all we do, all we have to do is just trust in him. He's ready, willing, and able. Jesus says, I kept them while I was in the world. And he said, I did not lose a single one of them, except the son of perdition. That son of perdition is just perdition. It's just a state of uh, final spiritual ruin. And that's what happened to Judas. Amen? We know he went out and hung himself or whatever. But it's just a final spiritual ruin. It was over. He was held back. Amen? And except for him, all the ones Jesus said that the Father had given him, hey, I kept them. Amen. Amen. But now I believe in the world. And so, Father, I just need you to keep them. Amen. I feel good about it. Knowing that God, Jesus, has placed me in good hands. The hands of the Father. And he's able to keep us. Amen. No matter what we're going through, how bumpy the road might be, but just know that we're getting through might be stormy on this side, and we have to go through that storm, but we're coming out. Amen? Because God has us covered. Amen. Amen. Here in verses 13 and 14, uh, let me read that. And now he says, I come to thee, meaning he's coming to the Father. And these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. He said, I've given them your word, and the world have hated them. Because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Amen. Jesus has this desire that his joy, uh, this state of, uh, I would describe it, joy, state of happiness, that emotion that's evoked by a feeling of well-being. Jesus is saying that, that joy, that, that my joy that I have be complete in you. Amen. Amen. Uh, the, Jesus, although he's going to be going through uh, this time of passion, this suffering, but knowing that the Father's things that the Father had designed for him to undergo, the things that the Father had instructed him to do, Knowing that he had fully and completed it in every way, there had to be some joy. You know, when, when this may not be a good analogy, but as a parent and a child, and, uh, when that child feels that he or she has pleased the parent, there's a, there's a joy. Yeah. Amen. And I believe that Jesus uh, expressed this same kind of joy and knowing that everything, including the suffering, including the shame, all of that had been endured for the Father's sake and that he had pleased the Father. Yes. 
Amen, somebody. That'll be every one of us. Our hearts desires to know that we please God. Amen. Whether that be little, but there's no little thing in the kingdom. Amen. If it pleases God, God sees it as a big thing. Amen. Amen. Because he, he, he's, he just uh, looking to want his children to bless him. Likewise, as he uh, blesses us, his children. He, he says in verse uh, 15 and on, he said, I pray not to take them out of the world, but he said, keep them from the evil. Yes. Uh, he said, just as you have sent me, Father, he said, I've sent them into the world. This one man that God has sent into the world, I think we can say without a doubt, Jesus changed this world. And just like he changed this world, we as individual born-again believers, we have the ability to change our world. Amen? When we're showing, exhibiting the light of Christ in our lives, letting, so to speak, our light so shine before men that they may see our good works, amen, the God of heaven is glorified in our lives, amen? So I'm praying not to take them out of the world, but just keep them, amen? And as you have sent me, I'm sending them. We're God's uh, Christ ambassadors, amen? Amen. We're to tell a sin-filled, darkened world about the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctify them through your true Father. That sanctify, consecrate, set apart. Amen. He says your word is truth. Amen. So he, he's, he's, he's pouring himself out to God on our behalf. Amen. He already knows what's in store for him. He, he's, he's going and uh, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also me, in me. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But this is what he said. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. So he knows where he's going. Going there to heaven, but, oh, glory, he's got to go through the cross. That was what that prayer in Gethsemane was all about. He, he know he's going to heaven. Amen. He, he know the glory that he had. All of that would be restored in heaven when he gets there. But he's got to go through the cross. So in Gethsemane, that prayer was a prayer, Lord, if it's possible. Amen. I, I know what this is like. It, it's going through this agony and this pain and suffering. I, I know I'm getting through, but do I have to go through it this way? Oh, he prayed that prayer. Yes, he did. But he was obedient even to death on the cross. He said, nevertheless, Father, not your my will, but let your will be done in my life. Amen. And here in verse 20 and 21, he, he prays for those who will believe on him through the message of his disciples. Amen. So he's praying for us. Amen. In that too. Because we're ones who believe on this message that the disciples spread. Amen. So he's praying for us too. Unity is what he's praying. He says unity that they may be one as you and I are one. Amen. Amen. That they may be one with you and I. That's the Father and Son. So don't you know what that means? That we've been invited to yoke up with the Trinity. That, amen? He, the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are one. And he wants us to be one with them. They just invited us into the house. Praise the Lord. Amen, somebody. Hey, but we serve a holy God. Be ye holy, he said, for I am holy. He ain't taking no mess. You got to be straight. But the invitation, he wants us to be one with he and the Father and the Holy Spirit. I've got to know we're invited to be part of the Holy Trinity, to be one with the Father, Son, and with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' prayer, I'm going to close on this. Jesus' prayer was intimate and personal. It was specific. Not the world he was praying for, but for his saints. 
His prayer was edified. Amen, somebody. When we could just read through and read through and read through it again how he's uh, making these intercessions for us, it ought to inspire us to be better in our own prayer lives. Amen? Amen. So his prayer was edifying to be, that is, to build up and give strength for his disciples. His prayers, we, I'm saying here now, should edify us today, not only for today, uh, but forever. Unity or oneness was stressed, amen, that we might be one with he and the Father and the Holy Spirit, amen. Unity brings about, uh, there's strength in unity, there's peace and there's love and harmony and all of those things in unity when the people of God come together. In the, in the yoked, abounded by the love of God. Amen? Amen. He closed uh, with this, his expression of the love that his father has for him. When Jesus is in Matthew, he talks about, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And he said, then he said, I will love you. But additionally, he threw in, and you will be loved by my Father. Amen. He'll love you. But the fact that you're obedient, not only will I love you, but the Father will love you also. Ain't that about to bless somebody? Amen. Just, just all I can tell you, just line yourself up. Amen. If you're not lined up or you work, get straight. Line up to make sure all of those blessings that God has for his children that you will be able to receive some yourself. Amen? This same love, amen, this same love that the Father expressed for him, the same love that he experiences, he wishes that same love that might be experienced by all of us, all of the saints of God. Amen? The love of God knows no bounds. Amen? It's bigger than anything you could only imagine. The Father's love. Amen. The Father's love. As he loved the Son, he loved us also. So we just ought to be mindful and know that the God we serve is a God of love. And our high priest, Jesus, he's praying for us. He's praying that the Lord will keep us, not to take us out of this sinful world, but to keep us from the evil and to use us mightily in the building of his kingdom. God can do extraordinary things through just a few people or one person. Doesn't need an army, amen? So never put your eyes on the sides of the crowd or the sides of the congregation. Just put your eyes on Jesus. He is able. He's more than enough. Amen. Won't you please stand? Amen. He is more more than enough. He's everything that we need. Amen. At this time, we just want to extend an invitation should there be anyone in our midst today that have not committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is an opportunity to do so today. God loves you. He loves you right where you are. He knows every issue, every situation. Uh, he knows uh, what's holding you back, what's keeping you from stepping out into the aisle, so to speak, and giving your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows all of that. He's patiently waiting. It's like uh, he's waiting in this long line of your life, waiting at the back of the line, waiting for an opportunity to come up and say, daughter, son, I love you. I die for you. I gave my very best to allow you to be reconciled to the Father of heaven. I prayed for you to cause you to come home. There's room. The Word of God says that His desire is that every man would come to repentance and no man should perish. That's heart's desire. He made eternal life, and eternal life was designed for His children have to choose. Amen. He's not going to twist your arm, not beat you over the head. He, 